it. Professor Mukherjee has always been a riveting speaker, uh, a very dear and loved teacher in the Center for Historical Studies, um, a public intellectual, someone who has always come forward uh, to talk on issues of importance, uh, and her work on modern Indian history, particularly on the anti-colonial freedom struggle in India is something that each and every one of us, uh, at least in the Indian context, are very familiar with. Uh, so it's an honor and a privilege to be uh, sitting here um, to facilitate Professor Mukherjee's um, talk here today. Uh, and I invite her without much ado to take over and uh, to, uh, to, to present her address. Thank you, Maha, and thank you, uh, everybody, for the very generous uh, introductions. And despite that, I think it's still an uphill task to keep people awake uh, in the uh, post-lunch uh, session. So I do have a daunting task. I will see at the end of it whether I've succeeded or not, or I see many heads nodding. <laughs> at least then I'll have some uh, pleasure that, you know, I could help towards a good snooze after lunch. So without much ado, let me first begin by thanking uh, from the bottom of my heart, the Association, uh, Asian Association of World Historians for this opportunity to share my thoughts uh, with this lovely audience. Uh, many thanks to Professor Akita and his whole team who've been with us in this for the last few years. Many thanks to the organizing uh, committee at JNU and many, many thanks to all the student volunteers. In fact, if I may just take half a minute, we forgot to acknowledge uh, those students, mostly from Delhi University, who are going to be, who are volunteering for organizing the entire online sessions. And to Professor Saurabh Bajpai, who's also a former student of ours, uh, who has uh, lent us his entire facilities uh, of his training institute, free of cost, for organizing these uh, online sessions. And there are about uh, more than 10 of these students, led by Akash Jain and uh, Kartikeya, who are here with us today, who are going to be organizing this uh, for us tomorrow. Uh, so I do want to put that on uh, record uh, as well, because they are going to be organizing four parallel uh, online uh, sessions, uh, you know, all on their own without any support uh, from any of us. So that's a great responsibility which they've taken. So uh, without much ado, let me begin. And I have a tough task also because I've been preceded uh, by three uh, outstanding uh, speakers with three outstanding keynote addresses. So let me get into my uh, job straight away. As you know, the title of the theme on which uh, I am to speak is Popular Movements and the State. And uh, this was conceived as part of the plan for the conference where we felt that this is an area which uh, needs attention. And it's also an area in which uh, some kind of comparative work is very useful within Asia and uh, between the countries of Asia and other parts of the world. So it lent itself uh, to, uh, to, to, to be an area which would be useful for a conference like this, because we were trying to see these linkages, these connected uh, histories. And I have in my address, uh, tried to uh, bring in many dimensions from uh, some theoretical and also from other parts of the world as well. The last couple of uh, centuries have witnessed a wide variety of popular movements in Asia. These movements have been against all kinds of states. Initially, they were against autocratic indigenous rulers or against the rapacious colonial states. The colonial states themselves were varied depending on which country was the metropolitan colonizing power. French, British, Japanese, Portuguese, or Dutch colonial states were different in character, spawning vastly different kinds of movements against them. Asia, like other parts of the world, witnessed popular movements against post-colonial communist regimes, 
post-colonial liberal democratic regimes, right-wing military stroke bureaucratic dictatorships, as well as religious identity-based oppressive regimes. So there's a whole variety and I might have missed out on some, but this is just to give you an idea of the kind of also broad and yet flexible theoretical framework that we need in order to grasp these kinds of diversities and still try to make sense of what is the relationship between popular movements and the state as I have called it. Of course, what I'm saying, I'm focusing a bit more on Asia because of the focus in the conference, but obviously this applies to other parts of the world as well. And I will be making references to some other parts of the world as well, not only Asia in my presentation. So in my presentation today, I would like to explore various facets of the relationship between the nature of popular movements, the forms of resistance adopted by them, and the nature of the state. This has been a subject of interest to me for quite some time. And many years ago, I had discussed the relationship at length in my book on peasants in India's nonviolent revolution, practice and theory. Just to recap a bit, I had then critiqued both the Marxist and the subaltern perspectives on Indian popular movements by pointing out that the nature of resistance whether it takes a violent or a non-violent form, for example, is not determined by the class position or the class demands of the protagonists, but is influenced heavily by the nature of the political structure of the state under whose ages they are functioning. To rephrase it, one's choice of forms of struggle, I said, whether violent or non-violent, legal or illegal, constitutional or non-constitutional, is basically determined neither by one's position in the social hierarchy. It's not as if you are at the bottom of the social hierarchy, you will necessarily adopt violent methods of resistance, for example, as is often uh, projected, nor even by the nature of the demands one is making on the system. It is not as if the more revolutionary your demands, you will then use violence. Uh, and the less revolutionary or demand, you will become nonviolent. Uh, though at, that is the demands, that is by the aims of the struggle. It's not determined by the aims of the struggle, though both have some role in such determination. None of these are absolutes, please. The choice is largely determined by or is linked to the nature of the political structure of the state. And I'm using these terms loosely for want of uh, more rigorous theoretical terminology, which I don't want to get into, in which one is operating. And here one can distinguish broadly between two types of state structures or political setups, those <coughs> that are hegemonic or semi-hegemonic, and those that are non-hegemonic or authoritarian or autocratic. I'm using here terminology that was developed by Professor Bipin Chandra in his famous address to the Indian History Congress on uh, uh, long-term dynamics uh, of Indian national movement, in which he first used these ter this terminology to, to distinguish the colonial state from other state forms. And then he tried to locate the specificity of the forms which the Indian freedom struggle adopted, as then finally refined by Gandhi into a whole model. Uh, in that particular context of the state. So obviously my uh, understanding is heavily based and influenced on Bipin Chandra's work. And I've tried to take it forward and apply it to different uh, contexts. For example, the peasant movements and as you will see to movements in other parts uh, of the world as well. The ruling classes in hegemonic or semi-hegemonic state structures the foundations of whose authority do not rest primarily or solely on force or coercion, but more or also on the strength of the institutions and ideological apparatuses that structure this hegemonic ideology over the whole of society. That is states who operate with the notion that they, lose, that they rule largely through consent and not through coercion are compelled and propelled by the very nature of their structure, by the very nature of their own ideological uh, structure and beliefs, 
to provide space for peaceful and legitimate within courts on non-coercive forms of dissidence and protest. If they do not, they bring into question the hegemonic foundations of their own rule and expose its coercive underpinnings, thus bringing about a weakening of their own hegemony over civil society and the state. However, while being compelled to allow non-coercive forms of protest, they are simultaneously able to disallow without losing or greatly weakening their hegemony, violent or coercive forms of protest. They are even able to use force to crush those who take to violent or coercive forms of protest without bringing into question the hegemonic foundations of their authority. If they are able to show that the societal consensus on non-use of violence is being violated by those who are resorting to violence, to the coercive forms of protest, and their own use of force is only intended to enforce that societal uh, consensus. In this manner, they are able to crush and deny legitimacy to violent or coercive forms of protest. In these situations, therefore, protest and resistance tend to take on, not automatically, but through a process of trial and error and debate, a peaceful, non-violent or non-coercive form, if they are able to be viable, if they are to be viable and effective and seen as legitimate by civil society as a whole, including the exploited and dominated classes or strata. Conversely, however, non-hegemonic or autocratic or authoritarian state structures provide little or no space for peaceful forms of dissidence and resistance, and such space therefore gets exhausted very quickly, being based much more on open autocratic assertion of authority rather than on the building up of ideological hegemony or consent through complex institutions, ideologies, and ideological apparatuses, they tend to come down with a heavy hand on all forms of dissidence and protest. Therefore, these uh, non-violent or non-coercive forms of protest are allowed only a very limited existence. And resistance therefore tends to take on often a violent character. Also, because it is clear that the non-coercive forms are both ineffectual and incapable of being sustained, the alternative coercive or violent forms acquire a legitimacy in the eyes of the people. It is perhaps necessary to clarify here that while making a distinction between hegemonic or semi-hegemonic and non-hegemonic or autocratic and authoritarian state structures, it is imperative that we recognize that even those political structures that are characterized as non-hegemonic have many hegemonic elements or features and vice versa. One would in fact tend to agree at a general level with E.P. Thompson, I quote that, very rarely in history and then only for short intervals, does any ruling class exercise authority by direct and unmediated military or even economic force. And would even and urge that this suggests that even basically non hegemonic struggles would include, if they are effective, many elements of hegemonic struggle. So it is a complex relationship. These are not pure forms either of the state or of the uh, struggle. And there's lots of gray areas within. And yet, I think it's important to try and delineate these times. There's another feature of the state which is important when it comes to strategies and forms of uh, resistance. Whatever the character of the state, whether it's hegemonic or, or you know, autocratic, it is also its power, that is its capacity to repress, its administrative efficiency and the force at its command that influences and determines the nature of forms of protest. If the administrative machinery of the state, its police and military arms, its financial capacity to bear the costs of repression are all in good order, then it's likely that the cost of violent revolt against it may be so high and the possibility of its success appears so remote that people may hesitate or refrain from resorting to such forms. 
for example, and this is a point to which I will come later and expand at considerable length, many contemporary, that is contemporary to us, oppositional movements operating within and seeking to transform autocratic or semi-hegemonic political structures have chosen the path consciously of non-violent mass mobilization and protest rather than violent insurrection. This is the point, as I said, I will elaborate later on. It is therefore not unlikely that the enormous power and reach of the contemporary repressive state apparatuses has been a factor in determining the nature of the choice. It is possible to argue that the enormous repressive powers that modern technology, modern weaponry has given to the contemporary modern states combined with the increasingly hegemonic character of the state structures is more than likely to increase the relevance of strategies of social transformation based on nonviolence. In fact, I argue, nonviolence may soon become, if it has not already become, an essential ingredient of viable strategies of social and political change in many, if not in most parts of the world. Another factor influencing the choice could be the necessity of waging hegemonic struggle, even against uh, autocratic political structures, given the presence of hegemonic elements within them, a point to which I had drawn your attention earlier. Of course, the opposite of this is true. If the state structure itself is in crisis, it is weak and disorganized, its capacity to suppress is in question, then the tendency to pose a physical and violent challenge to its authority will be stronger. The costs will seem less severe and the possibility of success much greater. So that would be a factor that could encourage violent rebellion. For the Chinese revolution, for example, the famous historian Bianco had pointed out many years ago, I quote, peasant disturbances could occur more readily in connection with such political factors as the semi-anarchy or chaos which prevailed in parts of the Chinese countryside. He's talking about the period between the 20s and the 40s, you know, part of the whole period of the Chinese revolution. You know, that was a period of warlordism, breakdown of the authority of the state, colonial powers were competing, the Manchu dynasty couldn't really establish. So in that context, the tendency to take to violent forms would be much greater because there is no one state uh, there, in fact, which can repress. The role of the strength or weakness of the state in influencing the possibilities of violent challenges to its authority has also been recognized by Theda Scotchpole and James Scott, though in very different frameworks. Scotchpole, in her now celebrated study of social revolutions in France, Russia, and China, in a comparative historical framework, emphasizes that successful social revolutions based on widespread peasant revolts occur when the state structure itself is in a crisis for various reasons. That's a major element in her analysis. Scott, on the other hand, uh, I'm talking about James Scott, who's, you know, whose whole work is on uh, the weapons of the weak and how the peasants do not use violent forms of protest. He lays stress on the other side of what is the same coin. And he holds that the high cost of violent resistance against powerful state structures is one factor that inhibits free to frequent recourse to this violent means of protest. In Scott's argument, this also contributes to a reliance on what he calls everyday forms of resistance as a more effective way of securing peasant aims. In fact, Scott is very critical of peasant participation in large scale revolutions, violent revolutions, because he thinks that they are only cannon fodder and they get nothing out of it. So, you know, he, he therefore argues this, you know, from the, from the other side that the power of the state makes it actually very costly and uh, unless, you know, so the better, better methods of resistance are the everyday ones. And that's what he's done in many of his books, he's shown that. Okay. Neither of them, however, make a distinction, which I'm making, between hegemonic and non-hegemonic or autocratic state structures, and therefore miss out on many specificities which are conditioned by that distinction. They're only talking about the power of the state. 
Today, I would also like to focus on an important development in more recent times, which has to be brought into the discussion and its implications for popular movements analyzed. And this is the manner in which democratic state structures are being corroded from within while retaining their formal outward appearance. This is happening all over the world today. Elections continue, but are manipulated. Dissent is barely tolerated, but suppressed selectively to give an outward appearance of freedom. The autonomy of educational institutions is whittled down. <clears throat> The media is controlled through private capital, etc. Democracies are not killed, but as Levitsky has told us, they die. And they die not with a bang, but with a whimper. So you don't notice it's a slow bleeding to death. This has led to what has been called a crisis of democracy from whose contagion no part of the world is exempt. Brazil in Latin America, we are hoping Lula will come back. The US in North America, we are hoping Trump will stay away. Hungary, Poland, Russia, Italy in Europe, Turkey in the Middle East, India and South Asia. Uh, the older ones are of course there, Pakistan and many others. Uh, are examples of countries where democratic structures and values are being corroded and challenged by populist, authoritarian and fascistic formations of all kinds governmental and non-governmental. Sadly, I have to include India in this list. This is not easy one for us. We have been very proud of the democratic traditions of this country and still are. This country has defied many prophets of doom who had thought that democracy could not take roots among a poor, illiterate and backward people. But now, unfortunately, if we believe many independent evaluators from all over the world, uh, India has been going down rather rapidly in various indices that are used to evaluate uh, the strength of democracy. So I would say that we can differ over the causes, we can debate the extent, we can argue over the consequences and the remedies as we should but we cannot doubt the existence of this crisis with which we are faced all over the world. Democracy is not just a formal structure of representative institutions. It is a way of life which is sustained by a network of institutions ranging from universities to museums, to courts, to literary and art academies, by social, cultural, and political practices, by historical and intellectual traditions. We need to understand what makes it work and what weakens and destroys it. We need to look at how the institutional framework of the democratic state is manipulated through everyday means to promote authoritarian tendencies. How the term urban Naxal is now being widened. Even the AAP party has been graced with the uh, epithet uh, the other just a day ago. Uh, you know, it's, uh, as I said, we have to every day, we, we learn new ways in which uh, this happens. We, we need to look at how the institutional framework of the democratic state, I repeat, is manipulated to promote authoritarian tendencies uh, and to recognize that it is happening through the popular vote and not through subversion of the formal institutions of democracy, such as by suspending elections. One of the ways in which this subject has been approached uh, by scholars uh, is by trying to recognize the signs of the impending crisis of democracy. How do we warn ourselves? Do we, it will, will we only know after the event or are there ways in which we can anticipate and then hopefully prevent sliding down that road? For example, Jason Stanley, a professor uh, uh, from uh, Stanford, I think, in How Fascism Works, a wonderful short book, which all of you should read, identifies a list of common features of the path descending from democracy to fascism. Even the terminology, it's a path. It's not, you don't jump off the precipice on one, in one day, you know, you go down that path. He does so by citing a wide variety of historical examples from the late 19th century onwards 
and from a range of countries across many continents, right down to contemporary America. He reminds us that fascists come to power through elections. Even Hitler came to power through elections. But don't really believe in democracy and therefore do not hold further elections very often. So the, there's no guarantee that because there was one last year, there will be one two years later. They typically attack universities because they see them as centers of dissent. And the most attacked are, as he says, leftist or Marxist professors. So nothing new. They believe in a mythic past and in racial or national pride, in fantastic conspiracy theories, and magically make majorities feel they are victims. It is magical, you know. Uh, and use nationalism to dominate and persecute less powerful and more marginalized groups. This exercise is extremely useful for those resisting the decline of democracy by helping them to identify the symptoms in time and take steps to counter them. It is also extremely helpful to know that it is a global phenomenon, though with unique features in different societies which gives us some hope that we can build cross, uh, cross country solidarities in this uh, very difficult uh, battle. However, the question of why there is an almost global crisis of democracy today still remains. Why? Why is it happening? Why and how did Francis Fukuyama's prophecy of the end of history go wrong? He promised us endless democracy, endless growth, endless capitalism, you know, the world. Did the world change so rapidly between 1992 when he wrote that book and 2008 when the meltdown occurred, which started to put a big question mark on the new liberal utopia of endless prosperity and limitless freedom? Or was Fukuyama too dazzled by the collapse of socialism and what then seemed like the final victory of capitalism or the market that he forgot, for example, to look at the extreme inequalities within nations, between nations, for example, that would keep raising their ugly heads in one form or another, through wars, mass migration, civil unrest, and what have you. Many other theories have met similar fates. A top favorite at one time was that economic development would lead to democracy and its lack of development to its opposite. China has blown that one to fragments by fast tracking economic growth to unprecedented levels while hardening its state and suppressing any signs of democracy. Countries much poorer have done better on the democracy scale. In fact, a strong case has been made that democracy is not an extravagance for the poor, but a necessity. Amartya Sen won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1998, in part for showing that democracies do not have famines. This is because the relatively free flows of information in a democracy raise the flag on food and other emergencies, while the mechanisms of political accountability give politicians a powerful incentive to be responsive. Thus, quote, people in economic need also need a political voice, he says. Democracy is not a luxury that can await the arrival of general prosperity. And there is very little evidence that poor people given the choice given the choice, prefer to reject democracy. The rice bowl theory, he's questioning that. People only want a bowl of rice and they're happy. Similarly, Donald Trump and his lookalikes in Europe and the West have effectively demolished Samuel Hunt. I don't mean physically only the ones who do their hair like that all the time have demolished Samuel Huntington's theories of the clash of civilizations, in which he told us that the West differs from other civilizations in the distinctive character of its liberal democratic values and institutions. I'll quote, they make Western civilization unique, he says, these values. And Western civilization is valuable, not because it's universal, he says, but because it's unique. Trump has as little concern for these Western civilizational values as did other illustrious representatives of Western civilization, such as Hitler and the Nazis and Mussolini and the fascists. Uh, but as Amartya Sen writes, I quote, 
the championing of democracy and political freedom in the modern sense cannot be found in any pre-enlightenment tradition in any part of the world, West or East. So he rejects this theory that it goes back to Greek philosophy and therefore there's that straight line from pre-BC to post-enlightenment, you know, without anything ha having happened in between, uh, which is the root of Western values of democracy. And in uh, what, he, what we have to investigate, he says instead, are the, con the constituents and the components of this compound idea. And in this regard, Sen and many other Asian thinkers and scholars find the powerful presence of many of these elements in their own traditions. Sen demonstrates that there were strong roots for respecting pluralism, tolerance, diversity, and independence of mind in the diverse cultural traditions of India. For one thing, he says, I quote, it is difficult to outdo the Indian traditions in arguing endlessly and elaborately. I think JNU is a good testimony to that, straight in that tradition. The third century BC emperor Ashoka championed, he says, egalitarian and universal tolerance, a theme that runs prominently through many subsequent writings, including dramas and edicts. The Mughal emperor Akbar, who reigned for the last half of the 16th century, I'm quoting Sen again, promoted tolerance and freedom of worship and religious practice when the Inquisition was in full throttle in Europe. Mahalakshmi gave us an example of Kerala and the Portuguese then coming and the difference between the way the Christian, the grants were being given to uh, uh, Christians uh, in Kerala and how the Portuguese then came and looked, looked upon people belonging to other religions. Many other Mughal emperors of India also practiced tolerance and respect for differences to a degree far beyond what was known in contemporary Europe. Pankaj Mishra in the age of anger has argued a position quite different from others. I quote, he argues that the unprecedented political, economic and social disorder that accompanied the rise of the industrial capitalist economy in 19th century Europe and led to world wars, totalitarian regimes and genocide in the first half of the 20th century is now infecting much vaster regions and bigger populations. That first exposed to modernity through European imperialism, large parts of Asia and Africa are now plunging deeper into the West's own fateful experience of that modernity. It's a kind of repetition of what happened in the West. It's now happening here because they're going through modernity. And modernity is always a very cruel, harsh process. I'm just, you know, compressing uh, very, very roughly. He says, the large scale flight of refugees and migrants from the damaged areas, which has already caused wars in Asia and Africa is now creating political turmoil in the heart of Europe. So what's happening here is now being taken back into the heart of Europe. This is his kind of understanding of why democracy is dwindling because these, all these issues are coming to the fore. But are we condemned if we accept Mishra as societies to live out the fate thus ordained as victims of modernization, gripped by resentment and fears? Or is it possible to fight back with a great variety, no matter what the cause, with a great variety of forms and spheres of resistance from theater, film and the arts generally to civil society movements, to political groups, to transnational solidarities, I think the scope for resistance is enormous. The crucial issue is how to connect these into a coherent whole to make their voices heard. That happens when there is a broader societal movement against the erosion of democracy, which can then encompass all these within countries, across countries. And it is to the nature of these popular movements that we now turn. And we have, as I will show you, many examples from our own recent past post-World War II world, uh, which we can look back upon. And here we find, interestingly, that they are predominantly nonviolent in character while varying in the specific forms of protest or expression. Here I find it very useful to use the term positive resistance instead of just nonviolent resistance. 
positive resistance is little broader. It could be defined as that form of resistance, which in the words of Professor Marianne Hirsch, breaks the cycle of violence. But I would add that which breaks not only the cycle of violence, but of hate, of revenge, of anger, of discrimination. And it does so without compromising an inch on the resistance. Positive resistance aims to bring about an end to oppression by adopting methods which delegitimize and weaken and erode the weapons of oppression. So it's not just against one specific, it's against the whole structure of oppression itself. Use of violence is always justified by the oppressor by alleging first use by the, by the resistance or as a preventive to the use of violence by the resistors. This becomes difficult when the resistors have already proclaimed their non-violence from the rooftop, so to speak. Just as in the case of Gandhi, he could be condemned for many things, but not by the British, couldn't say that we fear a violent uh, movement. Though they did to try to do that also. In 1942, they kept trying to tell him, you are responsible for the violence that's happening outside, you condemn it. He never did, he was too smart. But when violence, is still used to put down non-violent resistance as it almost inevitably is. Once the resistance becomes powerful and challenges the power of the oppressor, it delegitimizes and undermines the moral authority of the oppressor in the society of, as a whole and increases the legitimacy of the resistance. That's what the whole game is about. Positive resistance breaks the cycle of hate and violence also by defining its opponent as the system of oppression, whether it is slavery or racial discrimination or apartheid or colonialism or capitalism or inequality or caste oppression or patriarchy or whatever. It does not talk in terms of neat categories of victims and perpetrators. Because it seeks justice through the ending of the system of oppression and not through punishment of individuals or groups or through reparations. These may happen, but they are not central to it. The closure that is sought is not at the level of individuals or families, but for the oppressed people as a whole, by the weakening and ending of the structure of oppression. How can you anyway, bring about a closure to the families of more than 3 million who died in a man-made famine in India in 1943. Any reparations? Could it bring a closure to them? Or the hundreds of thousands of non-violent civil resistors who participated in the Indian freedom struggle, whose families often starved and children were denied education because they spent years in British Indian jails. And I could go on giving many more examples. A very good example is the way Gandhiji ensured that Indians were trained to struggle against the system and not against individuals, however obnoxious, who ran the system. By continuously making a distinction between the two, the notion of seeking to punish individuals was entirely missing in the Gandhian framework. The, mass the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh was not to be avenged by demanding that the perpetrator General Dyer should be hung from the nearest lamppost, but by launching the non-cooperation movement and declaring Swaraj to be the goal. In the Quit India movement, British soldiers were surprised when young nationalist activists rushed to provide first aid to one of their group, hit by a stone from a bystander. And this is some, what somebody told us in, uh, in one of our oral history interviews. Thus, anger was directed against the symbols of enslavement, such as foreign cloth, which was boycotted and burnt in huge bonfires, against the salt law, or the Chokidari tax, or the land revenue system, as in Bardoli, and not against colonial officials. Great movements are about bringing about systemic or structural change and not about punishing the guilty. When the Queen of Britain died a few weeks ago, uh, somebody from the independent newspaper of London interviewed me and said, they wanted to know whether there was anger in India because when she came and visited Jallianwala Bagh along with her husband, they did not actually apologize, but only expressed regret. I said, well, I'm sure Indians would have been happier if she had apologized, but I don't think they really cared because that's not what it was all about. 
you know, even, even when Shashi Tharoor made his famous uh, Oxford debate and said reparation should be there, he said, give us one rupee. So that's because the whole story of the Indian freedom struggle is not about revenge. It's not about reparations. We wanted our sterling balances back. They were ours. But we were not asking for compensation. or How do you compensate for 200 years of discrimination, oppression, making a people feel, calling them a child people, saying you're civilizing a highly civilized people, you can't make amends for that. So there's no point. What you need to do is to get over with it and move on. Brit the, therefore, Britishers were always surprised even in the 50s when they came here and did not meet with any hostility when they were going around as tourists or visitors. I will now highlight some prominent examples to argue my case. Positive resistance, for example, is when on 1st December 1955, Rosa Parks, a black working woman, going back home in the evening from office, refused to give up her seat in a public bus in Montgomery to a white person and was arrested for her act of defiance. And the black resistance movement seized the moment Overnight printed 35,000 leaflets asking for a bus boycott by the black community, which then went on for more than a year, for 381 days to be precise. And this triggered off the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King emerging as the major leader. King consciously adopted, as you know, Gandhian forms of means of struggle, even sending his people to India to study and then train the black civil rights activists once they went back home. Their success in an otherwise democratic society, I'm characterizing the US society, an otherwise democratic society which denied civil rights to sections of its people on racial grounds, the success in such a society showed how effective Gandhian methods or nonviolent, the complex of nonviolent methods could be in a complex situation like that. And it is complex situations about which we are talking now. Therefore, I'm giving you these examples. These are not pure situations also, though there are some pure situations also about which I will talk. From the 1980s, I'll give you another set of examples from other parts of the world where positive nonviolent resistance succeeded against authoritarian regimes. In the first of what would be a number of people power revolutions. In fact, it is said that a wave of democracy started in the 80s. The Philippine opposition mobilized society with tactics of nonviolent resistance to split the regime and bring down the dictator, Marcos. I'll recount the events very, very shortly, just so you get an idea of what it was about. In November 1985, President Ferdinand Marcos under growing domestic and international pressure for looting the country and suppressing dissent for two decades, sought to shore up his sagging legitimacy by calling an early election. The opposition, however, had been very angry since 83, when the charismatic democratic leader, Benino Aquino, was assassinated on the tarmac of the Manila airport upon his return from exile in the United States. A government commission of inquiry, which placed responsibility for the murder on the Armed Forces Chief of Staff, who was a one-time chauffeur and bodyguard of Marcos. So you can see the nature of the regime. It can go up past if you're with the right people. But he was acquitted by a biased court and reinstated to his job, thus intensifying the unrest. A person who shot uh, Aquino, you know, in broad daylight on the tarmac was then acquitted. Thinking he could win a quick test of popularity, Marcos announced a snap election. But under moral pressure from the esteemed Catholic Archbishop, Jamie, Jamie Cardinal Sin, the normally fractious opposition united around Aquino's widow, Corazon. I don't know if how many of but I remember because following that whole moment uh, very closely uh, at that time, but you probably many of you were not even born there. And when Marcos brazenly rigged the election, the fraud was documented by an unprecedented citizen vote monitoring effort, the National Citizens Movement for Free Elections, as well as by foreign observers. And heading President Reagan's official US delegation of election observers, uh, Senator Richard Loger endorsed 
the Namfrel vote count, which is the National Citizens Movement count, as did the Catholic Church. I'm giving these details to show how popular movements are always a combination of various things. The church coming in, US support coming in, popular anger, a popular widow of a man who has been slain. It's not just one thing uh, that's leading to it. At the urging, uh, uh, sorry, so, so they could, with Bakos and Akina both claiming victory, Aquino called for civil disobedience, boycotts and other forms of peaceful protest to bring down the usurper. And what happened? Reform-minded military leaders started defecting from Marcos and recognized Aquino as the legitimately elected president. At the urging of the Cardinal Sin, who was the Catholic head, hundreds and thousands of Filipinos poured into the highway in Manila that connected the two rebel military bases and sat down and prayed on their knees. So what's the form of protest? Sit on a road and pray. If I say this should be a strategy, you laugh, but that's how these movements are won. In what came to be known as the miracle at EDSA, this was the uh, name of that highway, crowds linking arms and nuns holding rosaries stopped tanks and troops loyal to Marcos in their tracks. So Marcos fled into exile. That's how this movement won. Next year, it was the turn of South Korea. I won't go into the details. There was a military dictator there too and uh, who was not giving in to uh, the demands from the middle classes uh, and the youth. So mass protests emerged and the Olympics were going to be held. So the United States warned Chun not to force, not to use force because it would then become a world issue. How can they hold Olympics over there? So he was constrained by international uh, pressure. And in the face of all this, he designated a successor who also felt compelled to yield to the demands for constitutional reforms and the release of political prisoners and elections were then held. An even more fascinating and very different example is that of Lech Valesha or Vavensha, however you want to call him, who was a dockyard electrician, who as head of the Solidarity Trade Union, dared to bring down the totalitarian edifice of the hardest state in the Soviet bloc. Please remember, Poland was the hardest, much harder than the Soviet Union itself. And he dared to do this through democratic, non-violent means, claiming to be also inspired by Gandhi. The trade union solidarity was formed in 1980, and its membership rose to over 10 million. So once something becomes a mass phenomenon, you know, even a hard state like the Polish state has to think twice. Solidarity was banned, martial law imposed, Valesa arrested, but he had to be released after some time because the movement was so strong. The struggle continued in various forms till a round table agreement was reached in 1989. A semi-free election was held and Solidarity led a new government formed, a coalition government and Valesa became president in 1990. As you know, Poland was the trigger for the whole of East Europe and Soviet Union. Others immediately followed. It was like skittles going uh, down, one following the other. In the Soviet Union itself, and in much of Eastern Europe, please remember, it was not NATO armies or armed revolution by the people that brought down the structure, but millions of non-violent resistors armed with roses and candles, sitting in city squares till the mouths of the cannons that were sent to cow them down, turned away and the soldiers accepted their roses. That's what how those revolutions occurred. That's how the whole edifice came crumbling down. Positive resistance is when the South African Congress under Nelson Mandela struggled for an end to apartheid and white supremacy with the vision of a rainbow nation. Mandela was released in 1990, carried on negotiations with D. Clerk, his opponent, who had jailed him for 27 long years, but then he came out and negotiated with him. Till an agreement was reached, four years it took, and the first multiracial election was held in 1995, in which he then led the African National Congress to victory and became the first black president of uh, South Africa. Positive resistance also was a different kind. When the new government emphasized reconciliation between the country's racial groups, no 
punishment to the guilty, no revenge to the white, from the whites. Created the Peace and Reconciliation Commission, Reconciliation Commission to go into the past human rights abuses. A bold experiment in human history to try to come to terms with oppression without perpetuating the cycle of hatred, discrimination, and violence. I think the Peace and Reconciliation Commission was one of the most, uh, most innovative ways of what I, I think to me is the essence of the Gandhian method of taking that forward. Its problems are many, but so are its successes. And the inspiration that it provides that other worlds are possible. Coming to a very recent uh, uh, event, I'm jumping now a few decades. In June 2019, one and a half million people marched through the streets of Hong Kong to protect their fragile liberties against one of the hardest states in the world. The anti-extradition law amendment bill movement known also as the 2019 Hong Kong protests or the 2019-20 Hong Kong protests were a series of demonstrations starting on March 15, 2019 in response to the introduction by the Hong Kong government of the Fugitive Offenders Amendment Bill or extradition. It is one of the largest series of demonstrations in the history of Hong Kong and maybe in much of the world with thousands arrested often later on in violent scenes because the repression was so strong there would inevitably be instances of violence just as we had in Chori Chora. That didn't, make that, that didn't mean that the movement uh, became uh, violent. The protests began with a sit-in. Again, I'm pointing out the specific forms because we need to know these as well. The protests began with a sit-in at the government headquarters on 15th March, 2019, followed by a demonstration attended by hundreds of thousands. Crucial are the numbers. Is it hundreds? Is it thousands? It is hundreds of thousands. When you get hundreds of thousands of people on the street, no regime can actually uh, handle that. And uh, hundreds of thousands followed by a gathering outside the legislative council complex like their parliament, which then stalled the bill's second reading. On 16 June, one day after the government suspended the bill, so they suspended the bill, a larger protest took place for its complete withdrawal and against excessive use of force. Finally, the bill had to be withdrawn on the 4th of September, but then many other demands were there which were not uh, conceded. The unprecedented landslide victory of the pro-democracy camp, then in the following election, in November, there was a local election and there this pro-democracy camp again won uh, hugely. And this was uh, taken then as a de facto referendum on the whole city's uh, governance. However, the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 largely silenced uh, the protests and therefore there have been things happening uh, over there, but because of this, the, the whole movement therefore in a sense got suspended. I will give you one uh, example of a very different kind from another country. And this is not of a popular movement, but this is an initiative by the state, which can support the state. It's like the Peace and Reconciliation Com Commission. It comes in the same vein. The Prime Minister of New Zealand, a young woman, showed how to break the cycle of hate by her refusal to let the incident of the bombing in the mosque turn in an Islamophobic direction. We also need to recognize and learn from these kind of incidents. On 15th March, 2019, two consecutive mass shootings occurred in a terrorist attack on two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. They were carried out by a lone gunman who entered both the mosques during Friday prayer. <laughs> continued, they continued from one mosque to the other. 51 people were killed, 40 injured. The gunman was arrested as he was driving to a third mosque. His name was Brenton Harrison. He was described in media reports as a white supremacist a supremacist and part of the alt-right. He had live streamed the first shooting on Facebook, uh, on Facebook. He pleaded guilty to 51 murders, 40 attempted murders and engaging in a terrorist act and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole 
the first such sentence in New Zealand. So on the one side, very harsh, prompt action against you know, the perpetrator. But look at the rest of it. Prime Minister Ardern called the incident an act of extreme and unprecedented violence and one of New Zealand's darkest days. This is an act performed by a member of the majority community, the white community, let's not forget that. She described it as a well-planned terrorist attack and said she would render the person accused of attacks nameless while urging the public to speak the names of the victims instead. So his name was never to be mentioned in public. So newspapers and television, they all honored that. Flags on public buildings to be flown at half mast. The mayor of Christchurch encouraged people to lay flowers outside the city's botanical gardens. One week after the attacks, an open air Friday prayer service was held in Hegley Park in the center of the city, broadcast nationally on radio and television, attended by 20,000 people, including the prime minister, Arden herself. And she said over there, New Zealand mourns with you, we are one. And the reply of the Imam of the Al Nur Mosque was that he thanked New Zealanders for their support and he said, we are broken hearted, but we are not broken. A national remembrance service was then held on 29th March, after the fortnight after the attack. I won't go into more details about how funding and you know, for the victims and everything was now done. I think time is, uh, what is it, Maha? Are you keeping time? Uh, so, uh, 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 uh. so very briefly, I've already mentioned, so I will just, one or two aspects of the Indian freedom struggle that I wanted to highlight, I will, those would be my, uh, my last uh, concluding uh, part. So turning to the example of the Indian freedom struggle led by Gandhiji, uh, which remains perhaps to date the prime example of what I'm calling positive resistance. Uh, of course, this is very relevant to the discussion today because as I already said, it is on this basis of this movement that Bhutan Chandra had characterized uh, the colonial state as semi-democratic, semi-authoritarian, and then discussed what was the relationship between the nature of the state and the nature of uh, the uh, movement. And uh, so very briefly, in, in Gandhiji's hands, uh, the, the nonviolent uh, uh, resistance or satyagraha as he called it, the term, you know also that he didn't like the term passive resistance. That's partly why I'm also using the term positive resistance. He didn't like the quiet nature of the word passive because it was not as if you were not doing anything. You were just sitting back and being passive. So he used the word satyagraha because he wanted to bring in the concept of truth into the resistance. You are, your, your resistance must be also based on truth. You find the truth and then you stick to it. The sticking to is the resistance. You don't give it up under any circumstances. That's your resistance. For him, it was not an abstract philosophical concept, but it was a weapon that was forged in the flame of struggle and sharpened on the whetstone of hard political practice. While the word literally means to insist on the truth or stick to the truth, the heart and soul of Satyagraha was resistance. Resistance against injustice, discrimination, oppression, to any form of wrongdoing or unfreedom, be it racism, colonialism, patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera. And Satyagraha in Gandhiji's hands encompassed a vast array of forms of struggle. Satyagraha is not a form, it's the framework. A vast array of forms of struggle bounded only by the limits set by nonviolence. He chose, uh, I've already said that, he didn't like the word uh, passive. And he also wanted to posit the notion of adherence to the truth rather than to the law. Because civil disobedience means you're defying the law. But you're defying the law in the name of a higher law, that is the law of truth, your truth. And that's why you can defy the law that's being imposed on you by the regime, because you have a higher truth, and which is the struggle against uh, oppression. 
His notion of Satyagraha therefore embodied a complex strategy of militant, militant struggle of which nonviolence was just one part. We often say it, the method was nonviolence or the struggle was nonviolent, that it was. But it was much more than that. It involved a deep understanding of the nature of the modern state, of the capacity of the people to struggle, of the appropriateness of different forms of struggle at different points in time, of when to launch and when to withdraw a struggle. It ranged from non-cooperation. These are the range of the forms. Please uh, pay attention. It's not just non-violence. You don't say, I'm non-violent and sit at home and you struggle. It ranged from non-cooperation to civil disobedience, boycott, spinning of yarn to boycott and burning of foreign cloth, boycott of courts to non-payment of taxes, selling banned literature to making prohibited salt, from going on a hartal to going on a fast unto death. It included rallies and mass meetings. It included village meetings, visits to homes. It included sit-ins and long marches, candlelight vigils and offering of flowers to opponents as now the more contemporary uh, form is. What is the heart of it is? was I said, when hundreds of thousands of people, but the basic weapon for the empowerment of the people in Gandhiji's eyes was, what was the basic thing? The participation of people in their millions in political action. None of this makes sense unless the people come out in millions in political action. They take the political action. And he believed that if the masses were politically active, they could secure any goal they desired. So nonviolence was important for him, not only as a moral value, but because it did two things. It enabled and it necessitated the participation of the people. A nonviolent movement could only be successful if it had mass participation. And mass participation could only be secured if the movement was nonviolent. Thus ran the Gandhian dialectic. I can only explain it partly. In Bipin Chandra's words, the choice of nonviolence uh, was uh, became necessary in a hegemonic struggle, which, as he said, was a struggle on the terrain of moral force, because in it, a disarmed people were not at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the government. You can see there's an argument that I'm making about how nonviolence becomes a viable method of struggle against very powerful governments, because you're not fighting on that terrain. I'm not fighting where you are strong. I'm fighting where I'm strong. I'm pulling you onto my terrain and saying, come and fight on the terrain of moral force. You bring out your armies, but I'm not coming to fight your armies. How does it matter that you have 10,000 people in your army or you have a million? I'm not fighting them. I'm saying you're immoral. I'm saying you're taxing my salt. I'm saying you're taking away the food from uh, the plates of my people. So come and argue and talk. I'm talking of drain of wealth. I'm not coming with a sword to fight against your machine guns. So the whole strategy is of fighting on a terrain on which you are strong. To quote Gandhiji, an able general always gives battle in his own time on the ground of his choice. Not at a time chosen. They come and shoot you in Jallianwala Bagh. It doesn't suit you to fight then, but you go and start fighting. No, you fight one year later. He takes one more than a year to prepare for the non-cooperation movement. No. So you choose the time, you choose the ground on which you're going to fight. Again, I'm quoting Bipin Chandra. Nonviolence is therefore also a way of becoming equal in political resources to an armed state. How do you otherwise become equal to an armed state? If you don't become equal, you can't defeat that state. You have to become not only equal, you have to become more powerful. You can never become more powerful in that domain. To a crowd who, uh, I'm sorry, I think I'm taking too much time. I must uh, uh, I just go to the end and. Uh... Gandhiji himself pointed out how nonviolent struggle was the choice of the brave and not of the weak. This I think is very important. In Hind Swaraj, he wrote, what do you think? Wherein is courage required in blowing others to pieces from behind a cannon <clears throat> or with a smiling face to approach a cannon and be blown to pieces? Think about it. You have a gun in your hand. Does it take courage to shoot the person in front of you who's unarmed? 
Courage is about standing in front of that camera. Who is a true warrior who keeps death always as a bosom friend, who's not afraid of death, or he who controls the death of others? Believe me, a man devoid of courage can never be a passive resistor. Gandhiji's emphasis on nonviolence was also linked to his deep conviction that you could not separate the means from the end. He believed that the means were bound to shape the end. You could not hope to build a humane, caring, inclusive, and free society on the shaky foundation of violence. Why? And that's what we have seen happen repeatedly. The gun that is aimed at the enemy can easily be turned to car down a comrade with whom you now disagree after the revolution is over. Right? And it has happened all the time. If walls were not to come up between peoples, the methods chosen for resolving differences and conflict must be such that they ensure justice without breaking down communication. The Peace and Reconciliation Commission is doing, was doing just that. The Lakshman Rekha of nonviolence made this possible. <coughs> I end with a quote from him. When the atom bomb was used by the US against Japan in 1945, he said, the moral to be legitimately drawn from the supreme tragedy of the bomb is that it will not be destroyed by counter bombs, even as violence cannot be by counter violence. Mankind has to get out of violence only through nonviolence. Hatred can be overcome only by love. Counter hatred only increases the surface as well as the depth of hatred. The Indian freedom struggle thus under the leadership of Gandhiji provides us a rich canvas of experience of successful resistance in a very complex political situation where an exploitative foreign power justified its existence by presenting itself as a harbinger of modern representative and democratic institutions with all the paraphernalia of assemblies, councils, elections, modern educational institutions, rule of law, the judicial system, and partial civil liberties. A close study of many different components of this movement can yield multiple examples of positive resistance, which could be very relevant in the contemporary context, increasingly defined by the democratic deficit. <clears throat> 